let me tell you where we're going today in terms of what, what we're going to be um, ending up with. First, we're going to be talking about what our goals are in studying Scripture. We've already talked about why study the Bible. One of the things I want to encourage you all with is as we, study, as we talk about these different techniques, if you started reading K. Arthur's book, for instance, you're probably thinking, man, this is a lot of work. And you know what? It is. To do a full inductive Bible study is a lot of work, but it's the most valuable work you will ever do. If you find time to play bridge or play golf or have a, a garden or do any other hobby, if you find time for that, then you, you can find time to do this because this is more important than any of those other things. Because in this book, in God's Word for us, we learn how to live and we learn what life is about because we learn of God and our relationship with Him. And that's the foundation on which anything else that means anything has to be built. So it is a lot of work, but today I want to talk about the fact that there are different levels of um, study, different approaches, different levels of approach, uh, of intensity. If you get into this and you say, that's way more work than I'm prepared to do, well, shame on you, but there are some alternatives, okay, and different levels, and you may find yourself needing to start out at a level one before you get to a full-blown inductive Bible study plus. The first basic uh, thing I want to address as we get into this a little bit is that you need a basic familiarity with Scripture. You need to know more about what is in the Bible. Once you begin to get that basic familiarity, which is, it's hard, I mean, if you've never really been in the Word, if you've never really studied the Bible, if you've never been involved in so that you understand, um, I've had people in Bible study classes ask me questions that clearly, uh, people who've been in church their whole life have no clue the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament, or where Paul is, or where the Ten Commandments are, no idea at all. So one of the first things that you need to do is to get a basic familiarity with Scripture, and we'll talk about that. Then, begin to create a discipline of not just reading, but of studying God's Word. Then, learning to ask the right questions, which is part of what our topic today is going to be. And then the fourth kind of level is to begin to apply it to your life. So we'll, we're going to talk about those. Let's jump in first with some principles in personal Bible study. These are adapted somewhat from the reading that you're doing right now in the Rick Warren book and in the uh, K. Arthur book. The Rick Warren book is, is Bible study methods and the K. Arthur book, The New How to Study Your Bible. I have a couple more of the Rick Warren books if you don't, if you wanted one and didn't get it. So I can, I can uh, make those available to you. And then we'll talk about the NIV study Bible in a little while. First thing I want to talk about today is the critical aspect of getting content, getting value out of the Bible, it's almost as though people, historically, I come from the South, and people in the South seem to think like if you've got a really big one of these and you lay it on your coffee table, then somehow by osmosis that's going to make a difference. Well, it's not. Okay, That doesn't do it. You've got to be you know, open to this. You've got to be prepared to, uh, to let it infuse itself into your life before it's going to make any difference for you. And part of that is you need to begin to open this book, and as you read, you need to learn to ask the right questions. And there's sort of a four-phase, I think Kay Arthur and maybe even Rick Warren talk about three steps. I think there are four. Uh, there are four steps, stages, you need to go through in terms of asking the right questions of this book, the Bible, in order for it to mean anything to you. The first thing you need to do is you need to practice observation when you read the Bible. Observation simply means you need to ask the question, what does this say? What's it say? What's it say? Um, it's as simple as that. It's not any more complicated than that. Once you have said, what is this saying? Um, if it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life, what is it saying? Well, it's saying that Jesus is God's Son, and He came to save us. And if we believe that, then we have eternal life. That's what it's saying. Okay. The second level, if you will, of asking the right questions is the process of interpretation. Of you saying, well, what does it mean? Well, if you look at that passage, John 3.16, probably the most popular passage in the Bible, you say, what does it mean? Well, it means that God cares about us. It means God sent His own Son. It means salvation is available. It means I can have eternal life. 
Those are all the things it means, as opposed to what it says. Okay, this is what it says, or the words that it says. What it means in terms of my understanding behind it. The third level is meditation. What does it mean to me? Meditation, to think about it. To spend some time thinking about, okay, I know what it says. I've figured out what it means, basically. But now what does it mean to me? To, to try to internalize it somewhat. Well, if I have never made a profession of faith in Jesus Christ, then it means that that's available to me, and I need to figure out how I apply that to my life. <coughs> if, it, if I have family members who aren't saved, well, it means that they need to hear about this. I mean, in terms of, of that's an aspect of my, uh, what this means to me. So meditation, beginning to think about it, and think about how, how uh, does this apply to me, and then the fourth level, application, well, what, how do I actually apply this to my life? Do I need to make a profession of faith in Jesus Christ? Do I need to call my mother and tell her about this? I mean, what do I then do with this is the application. So those four stages. Observation, what does it say in a given passage? And you don't do that with the whole Bible. Okay? Um, it's got to be some, some reasonable quantity. Interpretation, what does it mean? Meditation, taking it in, what does it mean to me? And then application. How am I supposed to apply this to my life so that I'm different? Um, Rick Warren quotes D.L. Moody, um, and I'll go down to this first. D.L. Moody, the great preacher who started the Bible Institute and uh, the, the Moody Church in Chicago. He said the goal of this event, the, the ultimate goal is application, applying it to our lives, not just interpretation. D.L. Moody said the Bible was not given to increase our knowledge but to change our lives. So by taking the approach, observing what does it say, of interpreting what does it mean, of meditating what does it mean to me, of applying it, how do I apply this to my life, you move from just the information on the page to having it change your life. Um, someone else has said the issue isn't information, it's transformation. Now you start with the information, what does it say? But then you move through a process where you apply it to your life so that it becomes transformational, not just informational. All right? Now, part of the process, number two, which I skipped over because I decided to give you the Moody quote, is part of the process, once you establish this as a discipline, is you need to learn to write things down. If you lived 6,000 years ago in a predominantly oral culture, then you would be fine with just reading it because you would have been trained to remember it and apply it and all that. But you know what? If you don't write it down, you're going to lose it. If you don't write it down, you're going to forget it. Not only does writing it down allow you to go back and reread and re-experience, therefore, the, 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 what God gave you as you studied the Scripture the first time, but when you write it down, you are anchoring it in your mind and even in your heart more. Uh, people who study teaching, um, as, as a, you know, people who teach teachers how to teach kind of thing, will tell you that there are different ways in which people learn and different ways in which they retain things. One of the reasons that I use PowerPoint for this and for Bible study, even if I'm just putting the scripture up there, is because when you hear something coming in your ears, that gets absorbed one way. When you see it with your eyes, that gets absorbed a different way. And the two of them together anchor better. Well, the same thing is true if you read something and then you write your thoughts about it. It is anchoring it in you more. You keep it. You don't lose it as fast. Um, and it gives you the ability to go back and look at it again later. Right? You absolutely, what would we, and I'm going to talk about different styles, but that if, you're, if you were serious about doing Bible study, and you should be, then you need to be writing stuff down as you go through. We'll talk about what it is you're writing down as we proceed. It's also important as a principle that you need to pursue Bible study systematically. You don't cherry pick. You don't go, oh, well, I've got 20 minutes. Let's see. Here's a Bible verse. After all, a king who cultivates the land is an advantage to the land. Hmm, I wonder what that means. That's not how you approach this. You need to have a systematic approach where on a regular basis you are studying a particular a book of the Bible, a passage of the Bible, a topic of the Bible, you have to decide what is the approach I'm taking and then pursue it regularly and systematically or it will not work for you. And in case 
I hadn't said this already clearly enough. You need to know in advance that Bible study, if you take it seriously, is hard work. It's study. It's, it's like being in college, only with one particular focus, and that is to grow in your uh, knowledge and your experience of Jesus Christ in your life by knowing His Word, God's Word. It's also true that no matter how hard you work, you're never going to arrive. It's not like you can say, well, I'm going to work really hard for five years and then I can stop because I'll have it all absorbed. Right? That's not what God's Word is like. It is, after all, the living Word. I asked you all this question before. How many of you have ever read a passage of Scripture five or ten or twenty times, and then you come to it the sixth or eleventh or twenty-first time and you read it, and suddenly it has a completely different meaning for you? Because now it applies or fits to something that is in your life. God's Word is a living Word. And so it's always, it, it doesn't change in the sense that it's not what it used to be, but it changes in the sense that it becomes even more. And the more you invest in God's Word, the more God the Holy Spirit will bless you so that your understanding of it increases. Um, as much as I have read and studied Scripture in order to teach it, as I reread it, I find things all the time that I have read who knows how many times. You, know, you never arrive. And that's a wonderful thing. And when you first start taking this discipline seriously, the discipline of Bible study seriously, that's going to feel like a, a burden. Oh, man, you never really get there. But you know what? As you get into it and you commit yourself to that discipline, you will find God blessing you in that discipline. And eventually, your, your sense of it will be, isn't it great that this is something I can continue to study and have as part of my life and grow in and God can bless me with it for the rest of my life? It's not just a matter of, of having these you know, 66 books and getting them down and then being done. God will continue to use this to nourish me and flourish me and grow me and bless me and provide for me for the whole rest of my life. You know, this is a garden that never stops producing fruit in your life, if you will take it seriously. Any questions about that? I mean, those are sort of five background principles that you need to have in mind as we proceed. Any questions about that? You do know you can stop me anytime with questions. <coughs> so, let's go from general principles to some specific ways in which you need to prepare yourself for personal Bible study. First, you have to set aside time for Bible study. This is not something that you just catch time as you can because you will not do it. If you have a favorite hobby, Arnie, when do you play golf? 7 o'clock in the morning. 7 o'clock in the morning. Certain days of the week? Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Okay. That's important to him. He knows exactly when he's going to do it. How many of the rest of you have hobbies that you, you have times that you have set aside for that? Okay? If it's important to you, you will set a time. And you will keep that time. And trust me, there is nothing more valuable or more important or that you will take more, not only benefit, but even joy out of once you get into it, than learning God's Word. Okay? So set aside time. It won't happen otherwise. Now, in terms of what time that is... I sometimes think that some of the, um, in one of the other classes I talked about the uh, biblical theology movement that happened from the 40s until the mid-late 60s. The biblical theology movement, one of the things they did, they had some other problems, but one of the things they did was they really encouraged people to be involved in Bible study. Okay, that's why a lot of Bible studies started happening in churches and small group studies and things like that. And there was a strong emphasis, which you still see today, in having a personal quiet time. A lot of organizations, wonderful organizations, my wife was involved in InterVarsity Press for many years, and, and many other organizations, they developed this, this they would teach their, uh, their students and people and workers and everybody else, you need to have a quiet time, and the best time to do that is 6 o'clock in the morning. Right? You need to get up first thing in the morning, early, before all the other cares of the day, and have your personal quiet time, your, your study of scripture and prayer, etc. There's absolutely the right motivation behind that, but my, I think that that probably has ruined a lot of people who simply do not function at 6 o'clock in the morning. The time for... <laughs> Arnie's part of you, uh, Rosie. 
Now, for me, early morning is a good time. I get up every morning at 5.30, with rare exceptions. If I, had, you know, if I was running really late the night before or whatever, but usually I get up at 5.30, and that's not because I'm a saint. That's because when, that's when I function beds. So we usually go to bed by 10 o'clock. Um, that works for me. If that doesn't work for you, then the last thing in the world you ought to do is to try to get up at 5.30 or 6 o'clock in the morning and start studying God's Word with one of the, you know, oh my God, you know. <laughs> you're laughing because you, you know that it happens, right? Now, if you're a morning person, then that probably is the time you need to do one of the most important things you can do, and that is study God's Word. If it's not early morning, maybe it's mid-morning. Maybe you get up and you, you know, you make breakfast, you do chores or whatever, and you get to 9.30 or 10 o'clock, and that's the time for you to sit down and have a cup of tea or whatever and study. Or maybe it's noon, you have lunch and then you do it. Or maybe it's in the early evening after you eat supper. When is your best time? If we believe, and I do, and I hope you do, that this is one of the most important things you can do in your life as a Christian, then what is the time in which you're going to be most productive? Early morning is good if you're a morning person because it's before you get wrapped up in everything. But if that's not when you function, then don't try that. You'll be miserable and it won't work. So be practical about that. Okay. The second thing, which is critically important, is that you pray before and after you do Bible study. And I'm not talking about you know spending an hour on your knees for this. But for me, when I sit down to study Scripture, my prayer is usually something like, Lord... Open my mind and heart. Help me to understand this and see more of you in it. Amen. If you are, Rick Warren gets into the fact that Scripture says that if you have sin that is glaring in your life, then you will not hear God's Word clearly. And so it may be that you need to have a time of confession before you start. To confess sins or failings or whatever. You, if, that, if, if, if the Spirit brings that before you, then that may need to be part of your prayer. But a simple, a simple prayer to ask God to give you wisdom and direction. And you all have been taking my classes. How do I usually open in prayer? Holy Spirit, open our minds, open our hearts, protect us from going in the wrong direction, guide us to things we want to know, so we can learn more of you and learn to love you more. That's always my prayer. And you're going to hear me, if you stick around the classes and, and Bible studies in church, you're going to hear me pray that a lot. Because that's what I need to say before we do something like this. Well, you need something comparable. Whatever your heart needs to say to the Lord, a com brief conversation with Him before you open His Word to learn from it. And then when you're done, a short prayer of saying, thank you, Lord, for the gift of this, your Word. Help it seep into my heart. Help me keep it and retain it and learn to apply it to my life. Amen. So we're not talking about, you know, benedictions at major events here. We're talking about you having a simple conversation with God before and after you study His Word. Because you need the Holy Spirit's guidance. The great truth of this, of this is not going to be available to you unless God opens your heart and your mind to it. So ask Him for that. Because He wants to do that. But if you try to do it by your own strength, if you try to sort of force your way into understanding it, you're not going to get there. Right? You'll ask me questions if you have any, right? The third thing is as you pursue this discipline, you do need to write down your thoughts. Your thoughts, your observations, your interpretations, questions, applications, etc. I think it's Rick Warren that says if you read a passage in, in the inductive process, before you go to other, other sources, other study aids, and we'll talk about those study aids later. If you're reading this and you read it two or three times and you go, I honestly, seriously, do not understand what that means. Write that down. I agree with Rick Warren. Even that is an act of processing, of meditating, of trying to you know, seek the meaning of something. And then you can go to some of the other tools, and, and, and scholars and writers and others can help you understand it. But you will not grow or learn optimally, meaning to the extent that you can, unless you are willing to write it down. You must be willing to write stuff down. I've often thought about the fact that um, all of the great religions of the world have written documents. 
The weird thing is that some of the really awful religions in the world that have lasted and have grown, some of the ones that really are fundamentally wrong, Mormonism, for instance, Scientology, uh, Christian science, um, why have they lasted when so many other false religions have fallen away? You know why? Because their founders wrote what they believed down. Joseph Smith wrote the Book of Mormon, and later he did his own translation of the Bible. Um, L. Ron Hubbard, who founded Scientology, um, wrote Dianetics and other books that carry that on. Um, the Christian Science, they have a key to interpretation of Scripture by Mary Baker Eddy, and on and on and on. My point is, whether, whether true or false, the key to something being lasting for you is if you write it down. If you don't write it down, you're not going to benefit from it. And I can think of no greater gift. This has never occurred to me until right now, but I can think of no greater gift than if you, in studying the Word, are writing things down, and then at some point in the future, your children or your grandchildren or, you know, neighbor kids or somebody else would, would receive your notebooks and be able to read what God was saying to you as you were studying His Word. Wouldn't that be an extraordinary gift? So it's, it's a valuable thing for you and for others. Ron? Is there a short definition for inductive? We'll get to that. Inductive basically means to, to focus yourself to see what, what God would have you understand from Scripture, rather than reading what somebody else says it means. Inductive means to take the Scripture and to, to let it speak to you. Rather, deductive is to take outside sources and apply them to something else. All right? But we'll get into the details of that. Yes, Ron, did you have a question? Okay. And then the fourth thing is well, set aside time, pray before and after, write down your thoughts, and then the fourth, make sure that you have the right tools for serious Bible study. And I'm saying serious Bible study. There is no more valuable thing for you to do. If you had to choose between studying God's Word or attending the Institute classes, buy, go home, study God's Word. All right? It's more important. It's more valuable. In fact, I've quoted this before. Um, Walnut Creek, which is one of the biggest churches in America, did a survey of 250,000 Christians from 1,000 different churches. And it was a long survey that they did. They asked them a lot of questions. The bottom line is to figure out where people are in their, in their faith walk, how mature they are in their faith, and what factors led to them being more mature. This study that was done of 250,000 Christians identified that far and away, without competition, with almost more than everything else combined, the number one factor in people being mature in their faith and joyous in their faith was study of God's Word. More than an active prayer life, even. Okay, although those things almost always go hand in hand. If you are really a student of God's Word, then you will find yourself in the person of prayer. But more than attending church services, or attending Sunday school class, or volunteering in the church, or volunteering for Christian charitable organizations, or anything else, being part of a small group, those are all wonderful things, and they're valuable things. But by far, the number one most important thing for people to grow in maturity in their faith and to find joy in their Christian faith is this, to study God's Word. Yes? Is that not the Willow Creek instead of Walnut Creek? It's Willow Creek. Willow Creek outside Chicago. Walnut Creek's in California. Okay. Right. The study was from Willow Creek? Yes, Willow Creek did it. I mean, they, they led it, but then they had other people from outside participating in terms of running it. But um, there's actually a book, the name of which I am not remembering right now, because they took all of their findings and published it in a book, um, which, which actually was the thing, reading that was what motivated me to preach a series at our church not too long ago on uh, growing in the Christian faith. <laughs> they're, they're the ones that, well, Jesus first, but they, they, their definition of Christian maturity was to grow in love for God and in love for one another. As Jesus said, the first commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The second commandment is love your neighbor as yourself. So it's reasonable to say Christian maturity is defined in our growing in those two ways. Growing in our love for God and growing in our love for other, one another. And so that is how they sort of define maturity. And they said, how do we get there? And then they evaluated all these different options. 
And they also identified where people were in terms of, are they seekers, not yet having committed in faith in Jesus Christ? Are they new believers? Are they sort of middle of the road? Are they uh, mature believers? Or are they sort of the top 1% of people who really are the people who make the church move forward kind of stuff? And, uh, and they evaluated where each of those, what the highest priority issues were for each of those groups. So it was very well done, very in-depth. Uh, you know, I work in marketing, and a lot of what I've involved in over the years has been marketing research, and this was a well-conceived study. Um, but again, the point was, far and away the most important factor in people growing in maturity in the Christian faith and in their joy in the Christian faith was the study of God's Word. Because that leads to everything else being meaningful. Okay. So, make sure you have the right tools. So what are the right tools? Um, the first thing I would recommend to you is that you have two Bibles to start. I'm going to recommend some more than that in a minute. And you go, two? Why would I have two? How many novels do you have in your house? You know, How many copies of the Yada Yada Prayer Group series do you have in your house? Or whatever. Okay. Um, having two Bibles is not a big deal. And the reason I recommend two is you need to have, first, what I would call a reading Bible. Again, some of you who were involved in sermons where I was talking about this Christian maturity, I got into this. I recommend you have a reading Bible that you you read that does not have notes in it. Okay? Here I got you all to buy these study Bibles. I'll talk about that in a minute. This is my reading Bible. It is an NIV travel Bible. This is the whole Bible. It's not New Testament Psalms. Don't go there. The Old Testament is important. Um, and this is the New International Version text. Every morning, I get up, heard me say this, I go downstairs, I give the dogs their breakfast treat, creamy, I make some coffee, I take my coffee, and I go in and I sit down on the end of the sofa, turn on the light, pick up my Bible, which is always laying right there, and I go to where I finished, I just finished Psalms, and I start reading. I'm not reading notes. In this case, I'm not taking... I'm not writing stuff down. I'm going, to, I'm going to get into this a little bit later. This is what I call level one, where you just are reading God's Word. You're letting it pour through you. Now, I'll think about it. I'll read a passage, and I'll go, wow. That's amazing that God did that. Or, uh, I wonder, you know, I wonder why God did it that way. I, I'm not worried about the answers. But I'm letting this become a part of me. And you know what? I start in Genesis 1. And I go through to the end of Revelation, and when I finish Revelation the next morning, I go down, give the dogs a treat, and get a cup of coffee, and I go sit down on the end of the sofa, and I start with Genesis 1. And I just read it. I don't want to have all of the notes and the, the cross-references and all that kind of stuff, because I don't want to be distracted by that. For that time in the morning, and I will spend a little more time in prayer then, too. I will pray a little more before. I'll stop, and I'll talk to God about that. Since they hated knowledge, they did not choose to fear the Lord. Loving knowledge is one aspect of us loving the Lord. And I'll just think about that, and I'll talk to him about that. I don't have a time period. It's not 10 minutes or 15 minutes or 30 minutes. Sometimes it's 10 minutes. I will read until I feel like, that's enough for today. Usually I'll get to the end of a chapter, because it's easier to remember where I stopped next time. Okay. In fact, I have a basic thing. I will read to... Like here, if I got to page 564 in Proverbs, I would read through the end of chapter 3 because this, when I open my Bible to wherever the tab is, I'll know that the chapter that starts on that page is the next one. Okay? Simple as that. And I will read until I feel like, well, that's enough for today. And then I will pray briefly, and then I'll go do the stuff I need to do. I am not looking, for, remember I said earlier that a basic familiarity with Scripture is the first stage of this. Some of that you'll get from studying, but some of it simply comes from reading it. I'm not trying to accomplish anything. I'm not trying to meet any goals. I'm not trying to say, well, I read the Bible four times this year. <coughs> All right? I don't know how many times I've read the Bible. I don't really want to keep track. I will read it until the Spirit says to me, that's enough for today. And I stop. So I recommend to you that you have a Bible that is not a study Bible, that's just a reading Bible. Now, I recommend it be in the same version or translation as your study Bible. And I'll get to that in a second, all right? Does anybody not have a Bible that's in a modern translation? 
King James is beautiful, but it is not very useful for somebody who did not live in the 17th century. Okay. Um, besides, a lot of scholarship has been done since then, which means that a lot of a lot of what we thought was the best version of uh, ancient text that was used in, in King James, we since have better ones. We have the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Codex Sinaiticus, the Codex Vaticanus, all the most ancient documents we have, all were found after King James was written in the 1600s. Okay. It's not to say that that's not a blessing to a lot of people, but does any... Uh, uh, Becky? Um, is, I wonder how close is the New King James to the Vulgate? Because the um, I don't know how close it is to the NIV. They have the, the New King James tries to retain the beauty of the language and get but get rid of a lot of the problematic ar archaisms, you know, the archaic language. And they have added or, or made adjustments based on more recent scholarship. So the New King James is better in that regard. Um, and I don't have anything. The King James was a great gift of God to humanity as the as the first authorized. In fact, another name for it is the authorized edition because it was authorized by. By the king, um, so I'm not being critical of it, but for for somebody in the 21st century, it's not the best thing to read from. Do any of you not have a Bible that's a simple, good, readable, modern translation? Because I will give you one. What? Well, yeah, you want one? I'll give it to you. This is an NIV. With this is the reason why uh, I'll give this to you. And as you can see, it's large print. Um, doesn't have any notes or anything. This is a great Bible to just sit and read with. Because um, we had these as the first Bibles that we bought for our church. And then when we went back to try to, to get new Bibles, this edition was no longer available. Well, we didn't want to have half the Bibles, you know, turn to page 637 if you're in the blue Bible. If you're in the red Bible, turn to page 712, okay? I didn't think that would work. So we started again. So I've got these. Does anybody else need a good basic reading Bible, okay? I want to pat... Um, Sammy, would you come and help me? Mike, it's you. I think these are the back of just hand them out to one. And if we run out, I've got more. So you can use that exactly the way I do this. Put it on your side table after you give your dogs a treat in the morning. <laughs> make yourself a cup of coffee or tea. Sit down and just read until you feel like that's enough for today. Yeah. Why the, why the old Bibles except the paraphrased Bibles written in two columns? Uh, frequently, well, they're not they're not all. Uh, you can get a single column, yeah. uh, but well, I find it really difficult to read. I have a paraphrased Bible which I do check out right. all the time with my other Bible, and I found it very very consistent. Um, not. It's not really well. I buy the books, call it was his funny part. Okay. But it was written like he'll say, well he didn't think much of that, or it said with um, when they came back out of the promised land he said, Well God was really, really angry, so he he, he struck them all dead. Yeah. Well, uh, we'll talk about paraphrases. Uh, I know you don't really approve of paraphrases. No, I don't I don't disapprove of paraphrases. I don't think a paraphrase should be your only Bible. No. Okay. No, I check. If it's something weird, I think, gosh, and then I'll check this out. But it always okay. checks out. Well, and, and we'll talk about that. But the reason that all, most Bibles are in two columns is because this, in between, they put, and actually that's the one thing that my basic reading Bible does have, these are the cross-references. Which means if you read a passage right next to it, then it can tell you, well, if you're reading in Matthew, the parallel passage or the passage that relates to this in Mark or in Luke or in John, Go here. All right. Because my paraphrase Bible has that, but it has it down the side. Yeah, the side. Side. So it's so much easier on yeah. my eyes. Yeah. yeah. It's just a difference in style. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm not aware of any other reason. So, a basic reading Bible. And I recommend to you, and I'll, talk, I'll call this level one a little bit later, um, that if you, at the very least, just open God's Word and read it. And make it an everyday thing. And you know what? When I first started doing this on a regular basis, which was after I had a Master of Divinity, I mean, I was reading the Bible earlier, but when I made this a sort of every morning discipline for myself, I had a thousand other things I thought I ought to be doing. You know, I'm, I don't know if you all realize this, but I'm pretty busy right now, okay? Uh, not only with 
church and with the institute, but I'm also a consultant. I have clients, you know, making demands on me, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the one thing I will not skip now is this in the morning, because this settles me, it calms me. It gives me a sense of perspective, and when I do that, I then can turn and do the other things I have to do in a way that makes more sense, instead of starting out frantic and getting worse. Okay. Um, John, John Calvin once said that he, because Calvin was not only leading the church in Geneva, Switzerland, and, and writing the theology which became the form theology on which Presbyterians are built, um, he was also the civic head. He was like the governor of Geneva. He was running the, the government as well. And he once said that I am so busy with all the demands on my life that I find I cannot get them done unless I spend three hours a day in study and prayer. Okay? You will find that this changes things for you. Was there a question or comment? Okay? So, and any of the rest of you, if we didn't have enough when you handed them out, I'll give you one later because I've got more of them. Okay? Those are our gift to you. Um, so, uh, where do I put that? then, in addition to the reading Bible, I recommend you have a study Bible. Many of you bought, I required it for people who are taking this class for uh, either a certificate or a degree, that you have a Bible that has references in it. The study, NIV study Bible is the one I recommend. And by the way, the NIV, there's nothing magical or especially ordained about the NIV. I like it. And Rick Warren recommends it, particularly because the NIV became the most popular um, English Bible not long after its, its first publication in the, in the, well, the New Testament versions of it came out in the late 60s, I think, but in the 70s. Um, and they've re they've done new versions of it. They've updated it since then several times. The latest one is 2011. Um, it has not only cross references. It has lots of footnotes for those of you who have one. It has introductions to every chapter of the Bible, which are quite good. It's got charts and maps and photographs and all kinds of stuff. In the back, it's got um, a pretty good concordance, I'll talk about what that is, and a, a topical guide, and maps, and all kinds of stuff. You need to have a study Bible. I have more of these available for purchase, if you want one. Exactly what it costs me, which is the equivalent of 400 pesos. You need to have a study Bible. Okay? Does anybody else want to buy one? If so, you can see me at the break. And again, there's nothing sacrosanct about the NIV, but one of the advantages is that it um, it not only is a good translation, and the NIV Study Bible not only has a lot of resources, but one of the other things that you want to look out for is does it are there other tools that are that are linked to that? For instance, if you have an, a, a concordance that's linked to the King James Bible and you're trying to find a word, you know. You, it doesn't line up because there are different words used in the NIV for the same thing than in the King James. Because there's a different word used in the 2011 than was used in 1611. Right, so are there other tools and resources that you can, you can use for that? Now, what right? exactly is a concordance? Okay, I will talk about that. When I say you want a good translation, two Bibles in the same good translation, my definition of good translation is um, that it's scholarly, that there was good scholarship behind it. Uh, I don't have a problem with paraphrases. Do you know the difference between translation and paraphrase? Translation is where they go back, and I say they because almost, uh, I think every translation has had, a, has had a, a group of scholars, not just one. A group of scholars, they go back to the original languages and the ancient, the, most, the oldest sources we have, and they translate it from the original languages into modern English. Okay, that's a translation. A paraphrase is where someone, and it's usually one person, in the case of the Living Bible, it was Ken Taylor. In the case of the Message, um, it's Eugene Peterson. They take the Bible, and like Eugene Peterson, who's a Bible scholar, he, some, he went back to the original languages some, but for the most part, he took a good English translation, and he put it in words that he feels bring the meaning out better. Okay, it's, and Eugene Peterson's the first one to say that the Message, which I'll, I'll show you later, the Message is how God has helped him understand the Bible, right? And uh, that it's not 
a translation, and he doesn't think you should use that for your only Bible. But it's very valuable, along with a good, solid, scholarly translation. So, a good translation should be scholarly, it should be easily understandable, which is one of the problems with the King James. Right? There are a lot of expressions in the King James which, 400 years later, we really don't get. It needs to be one that you feel comfortable with. Some of them have different styles. I mentioned before, two basic approaches to translating the Bible is one is literal word for word, where they will go in, and the Revised Standard Version is a good example of that, where they took each word in Hebrew or Greek or Aramaic in the case of part of the Old Testament, and they translated it to an English word, so that they've got this long string of words, and then they figured out how do we rearrange these in a way that makes sense in English, because languages have different orders for words. You know, we, we're used to noun, you know, adverb, verb, noun, object. That's not how most languages are set up, even modern languages that are not English. And so they'll literally translate word for word, and then they'll rearrange it to seem to make sense. The other process is one called dynamic equivalence, where they will look at the phrases or the sentences in the original documents, and they will say, how do we best translate that sentence or that phrase, not word by word, but a sentence at a time, or a, a phrase at a time, or a thought at a time. To me, that's more effective. The, the NIV is a dynamic equivalent approach. The RSV, Revised Standard Version, um, was a literal word by word. So it, it, when I say what feels good to you, some people are more comfortable with kind of a more rigid formal, and some appreciate the dynamic equivalent approach. Also, um, a good translation is one for which there are study tools available. Dictionaries, concordances, etc. The NIV, one of the advantages of that, and this is what Rick Warren says as well, is that it's been around and it's become so popular that virtually any of the kinds of tools you might want to use, you can get that are keyed to the NIV. Traditionally, um, before the 1950s or whatever, every study tool you wanted to use in English would be keyed to the King James. And I, I'll give you a funny example of that, kind of in reverse. When I first started studying scripture and going to, to uh, I was a counselor of Bible camp, which is where I learned more, more Bible than anything else. We had some great Bible teachers. I learned the King James. Well, now I don't use the King James, but when I'm, when I'm looking for a passage and I, I know just a, a fraction, you know, I know just part of the verse and I don't remember the references. I, I am terrible at remembering the references, the book, the chapter and verse. Okay, I confess. I'll remember the words. I forget the chapter and verse. So I'm looking for the chapter and verse, because you people expect me to know the chapter and verse. So I'll know the, the scripture, and, but I will have not learned it in the King James originally. And I can't find it, because the words are different in the NIV. So frequently, I'm going to show you in a little while computer Bible. I use the PC Study Bible, which is one of the, one of the ways that God blessed me so that it was okay that I gave away all of my theological library before I came down here, or 90% of it. Um, I can switch versions like that on the computer and look look up the word I'm looking for that I learned in King James, and when I find it, I then can switch to the NIV in the same verse, and there. So I have to sort of back into it. But um, you know, it makes a difference what tools you have and whether they line up with the version of the Bible that you're using. Do you understand that? Did I make that clear? Okay. So I recommend you have two Bibles: a reading Bible. A good study Bible. Next week, we're actually going to spend quite a bit of time with the NIV study Bible. And if, if you're in a certificate or a degree program, you have to have the NIV study Bible. If you've got some other study Bible, that's fine. You can, you'll still get a lot out of it. But next week, we're going to take the NIV and begin to look at all the pieces of it and how you use them and how valuable they are. Because this really is a theological library in one book. And I know people have complained that, oh, I have to get a dolly to haul this thing around on. But, and, and, and I had people say, man, the print is so small. And I said, okay, everybody's complaining about how big this is. You imagine how big it would be if it was large print? So, you know, you, there's only so much you can do. Um, My arms aren't strong enough to hold this up. Exactly. Yeah, that's why you need a reading Bible, right? Um, the, the study Bible is intended to be used on a desk. The second thing you need to have is a loose leaf notebook. Now I say loose leaf for a reason. So that you can take pages out and put them back in. Um, 
very simple, and, and, and you know, like lined notebook paper, not spiral bound, because there's only one direction that paper goes from a spiral bound, and that's out. You can't put it back in. There will be times when you take notes and you want to rearrange them. Or you maybe you're you know in a park somewhere and you've got just your notepad and you want to write some notes and then you can three whole bunch of them and stick them in there. It doesn't work if you have spiral bound or whatever. Get something like this. They have this flexible three ring binder. All right, and use use something of this sort. That's that's one option when I say a loose leaf notebook. One that you can add or remove pages. Or if you if you feel so called. You can get something like this. This is the New International Version of the Bible, the Cambridge Study Edition. And you know what's unusual about this Bible? It's three ring. It's a Bible. It's got study, some study aids in it. In the back, it's got tables of weights and measures. It's got a concordance and stuff like that. But it also has blank sheets. So I can make my notes. I haven't actually used this that much for in, in a long time because I do most of my stuff on the computer now. But for the longest time, in fact, I was going back through this stuff in preparation for this class, and I found a sermon that I prepared from Genesis, and I went, dang, that's pretty good. <laughs> I would have to preach that. Okay? And so there are options. This is only one of them. There are other options where you can get three ring binders of the Scripture with loose leaf things, to use as your study Bible. And I used this for years, um, along with, because um, when I was first starting using the NIV, this was fairly early. Uh, but like I say, I'll, I'll show you later how I use the computer to do the same thing. So I use the computer more now than this. Uh, yes, Susan? You never gave us the definition of Okay, I'm going to get there. I'm going to talk about the study aids. So I will get to the definition of concordance and the topical Bible and some of that other stuff. So I'm not. Uh, when, when we talk about uh, other tools. In fact, we're getting there right away here. All right, third, here we go. Basic Bible study tools. In addition to the two Bibles and a loose leaf notebook, I recommend strongly to you that you have two or more additional Bible translations for comparison. I suggested to you that your reading Bible and your study Bible should be the same version. Partly because that way if you ever read a passage, you know, and you say, you know, I really do feel like I need to go, I want to go back and study that a little bit more. You're not going to spend half of your time trying to figure out why the wording is different in the verse. I had a, a, a teacher of mine in college who was Christian, and he frequently was the Bible teacher in a fellowship group I was in. And Richard used to say, he would start to, to he said, well, before I read the scripture, if you have your Bibles with you, close them and put them away. What? The reason he would say that is, I'm reading from the NIV. If you have the New American Standard or the Revised Standard of the King James, I don't want you to spend the next 15 minutes looking at it, trying to figure out why what you have is different than what I'm reading. All right. So sometimes it makes sense to have a, have consistency, and that's why I recommend that both your reading Bible and your study Bible, in case you do sort of cross over between the two, are the same. But there are other valuable translations. Um, I have up here some of my favorites. The New American Standard was the Bible. This is the Master Study Bible, which is a good study Bible, too. The New American Standard was the version that I used before I went to the NIV. And it's, it's a word for word, so sometimes you get a different feel from it. And it's, it's helpful if you read two translations or three translations, if there's a particularly knotty passage and you're trying to figure out, okay, what is that? Where were they going with that? What does that mean? It helps to read it in a couple of different versions because you'll have scholars who give you a slightly different perspective on it. So I recommend uh, oh, another Bible that I like that's quite new is the Holman Christian Standard Bible. This too is a study Bible. Uh, not quite as heavy as the NIV, but it's got some more to it. Um, it's got good charts and you know photos and all kinds of stuff as well. But the, this is a new, quite new translation, which I like. The ESV, the English uh, Standard Version, is also quite new and is quite good. Both of these are getting very good um, press. I mean, the, the people are saying they really like them. You also can, as one of those two additional translations, use a paraphrase. This is the message. 
or The Bible in Contemporary Language by Eugene Peterson. Um, as I say, Peterson, he was one of the professors when I was at Regent, he's the first one to say, don't use this as your only Bible. Um, Carolyn's niece and nephew-in-law uh, in used to go to a church where this was their Bible, this was their view Bible, this is the only thing they read out of. Well, Eugene Peterson hates that, because he says this is, I, he was a, he's a great man of God, very prayerful, and a, I think a, a really spiritual, godly man, but he says this is what the Spirit spoke to me in terms of meaning, but this isn't the original word, and you need to have the original word. But for using this for better understanding, or the Living Bible, which is also a paraphrase, those are good. So maybe what you want to think of, I didn't say that here, but another translation and a paraphrase, a good one. Bob? If you go to BibleGateway.com, I'm going to do that. All of these versions are on there, and you can switch back. I'm actually going to show you BibleGateway.com on the computer in just a few minutes. I have a Bible that has four translations. A parallel. Yeah. They have what's called a parallel Bible, which you can get, which has multiple translations so that you can look at one page and see multiple versions of it, if you would like. I have one written for teenagers. Okay. Well, they've got specialized ones. They've got ones for people in the military, specifically for men, for couples, for parents. There are a lot of specialized kinds of Many times that's not the translation so much as it is the, the footnotes and the extra writing. They'll help interpret it in terms of a particular group of people. Um, so, two or more additional translations, perhaps one good translation and one paraphrase. The next one uh, topic of, of basic Bible study tools you ought to have are some word and topical tools for that are key to your translation. When I say for your translation, I mean if you're using the NIV for your study Bible, then you need to try to make sure that you get tools that fit with your study Bible. Now, I'll, I'll, I'll give you, we sort of just did this because Bob mentioned BibleGateway.com. I'm going to mention several other books, and you're going to go, wow, that's a lot of books. You know, it's not. <laughs> I bet you have more cookbooks than this if you're women. Uh, probably more sports books if you're men. I don't know. I, I'm the one that has the cookbooks in our family. Um, but I'm going to get to, to a way that you can not have to buy any more books other than these two, you know, the two versions of the, the Reading Bible and the Study Bible. We'll get to that. But first, I recommend that you have, or have access to, an exhaustive concordance. Or as we used to call it in seminary, an exhausting concordance. <laughs> this is the standard. Strong's Exhaustive Concordance of the Bible by James Strong. This is based upon the King James. They have an NIV version of this, which they call the strongest NIV Exhaustive Concordance, just to differentiate. What a concordance is, every, and the reason it's exhaustive is an exhaustive, you can get a, a, an abbreviated concordance, like the back of the NIV Study Bible, or any study Bible will have a concordance, but it's not every word. An exhaustive concordance, you can look up any word that occurs, in this case, in the King James Bible, in the in strongest NIV, in the NIV Bible, any word, and it will tell you everywhere that it occurs. And in fact, it'll give you part of the verse so that you can see the context. If you are, if you're preparing a study and there's, you've got a word in the passage that seems like a really important word, like, like slave to Christ, where else does it talk about slave? You can look up the word slave in here and it will tell you every verse in the Bible where that word is used. And then you can go to those others and see, well, does, is that related to this? Can it give me a better understanding of it? That's what a concordance is. It is a, um, it's, it's a uh, place dictionary. You look up the words like you look them up in a dictionary, but instead of giving you a definition, it tells you where else that word occurs in the Bible. All right? Exhaustive means every word in the King James is in here. Now, again, your Bible, a good study Bible, has, will have a decent concordance, but it's not every word. That's... So it's clear what a concordance is? Uh, play that just anywhere. The second thing you want to have is a Bible dictionary and or a Bible encyclopedia. A Bible dictionary is also a book. Here, this is the Pictorial Bible Dictionary from Southwestern Company um, with pictures. It, like, like a regular dictionary or like the concordance, you look up words but instead of giving you the references, it may give you a few references to where, where that word occurs. But the primary thing is it gives you either a definition or an explanation. 
On this page I just opened, it's got the Epistle of James, and it tells you, you look up James, and it's got uh, James, the English form of Jacob, and it tells you what all that means. It lists some of the people who named James. It talks about James the less, and then the Epistle of James, when it was written, where it was written, who it was written to. You keep going, you come across, oh, words you've never heard. Um, Jericho, the city of Jericho. And it gives you the passages where Jericho is mentioned in Deuteronomy 34.3. The site, uh, the fact that there are three Jerichos, Jericho in the Bible, the fact that it may be the oldest city in the world, etc., etc. So it's, it's, a, it's an encyclopedia. It's a dictionary and encyclopedia. And pictures. And pictures. Okay, black and white pictures in this case. That's what a Bible dictionary is. If it's an encyclopedia, it will have longer articles on things. All right? Um, this is the Zondervan Pictorial Encyclopedia of the Bible, in five volumes. This is Q to Z. Same sort of thing, except it will have longer articles, charts, maps, photos, drawings, etc. Okay? Very handy for understanding what you're reading. Questions? Okay. Third thing is a topical Bible. Billy Graham, and, and I, I would agree with this. If I had one other tool besides the actual Bible that I could, could use, it would be a topical Bible for, for what I do. Billy Graham said the same thing, that the most used refer, the most used resource he has other than the Bible is a topical Bible. This topical Bible is the Nage topical Bible, which is by far the most common. The this one was... Knaves? Knave is the, is the maker. Uh, it's by Orville J. Nave, chaplain of the Army of the United States, uh, published by the Southwestern Company, N-A-V-E. Now, this one, Nave's, is linked to the King James, where you get into that problem, where you're looking for something. Um, you, it's, it's hard, but since it's topical, let me explain what that is. Now, this was given to me, I was head resident of the college dorm, this was given to me by the men, uh, the college men who were in my dorm, as gift, as I left to go to seminary. A topical Bible, instead of looking up a specific word as it occurs in the Bible, either to find out where else it occurs in a concordance, or to find out more about what it means in a Bible dictionary or a Bible encyclopedia, a topical Bible deals with topics. The perfect example for this is the word Trinity, you know, we, we believe in the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. The word Trinity does not appear in the Bible. But a topical Bible, you can look up Trinity, and it'll tell you all the references which we believe give us the doctrine of the Trinity. You can look up um, humility as a topic. It won't tell you where the word humility occurs. It will tell you all the places where there are verses related to that topic of humility. So a topical study is one of the, one of the methods of Bible study you can use, and this is the tool for that. Topical Bible. You understand the differences of what I'm talking about here. Concordance. You look up a word, it tells you every word appears in the Bible. A dictionary or encyclopedia, you look up a word and it tells you about that thing, like a dictionary would, a definition, or an encyclopedia gives you an article. A topical Bible, you don't look up specific words, you look up topics, and it leads you to them. Is there one in the NIV? There is. There is a, there is a, in fact, it's called the NIV Naves Topical Bible. Okay? And I don't actually have one, but I'll explain why later. Um, all right, so those are word and topical tools. You then get into handbooks and commentaries. First, a Bible handbook, which I think is terrifically valuable. Um, this little handy, handy little pocket version, the Nelson, Nelson's Quick Reference Bible Handbook, takes every book of the Bible, it gives you um, an outline, it gives you a chart which breaks it down into what the themes are in each of the different passages and stuff, and then it gives you written material that talk about the what they call a survey, which take each of the sections and tell you what, what's, what's being done there, or what's being, you know. So this little book takes every book of the Bible and gives you a pretty good understanding and outline and structure of the thing. Or you can go with one of the real standards in the last 60 or 70 years, I don't even know how long, 
the Haley's Bible Handbook, which same thing, it'll have maps, the book of Nahum, the, the doom of Nineveh, the man Nahum, who he was, talks about chapters 1, 2, and 3, Nineveh's utter ruin, etc., 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 okay? Um, for each book of the Bible. So those are handbooks. You also, and this isn't actually a handbook, but it, it's, it, they're related and valuable. Well, this is a handbook. DK, do you know DK, Dorley, Kinserly? Kins, Kinserly? Yeah. D, they're the ones that do the, the wonderful illustrated everything. So they do travel guides. The, 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 I get their travel guides whenever I'm traveling anywhere in the world because their tagline for the travel guides is, we show you what other people only tell you. Pictures, diagrams, maps, on and on. This is the DK Complete Bible Handbook, an illustrated companion. And in it, lots of pictures, lots of maps. They not only will deal with the Bible as you go through in terms of topic, but they'll look at things like sacrifice and ritual, women, um, empires and kingdoms that have existed, um, the book of Nehemiah. See, they actually take the books of the Bible, but they also take a lot of topical things. Confessions of Jeremiah. Uh, ethics and behavior in the prophets, the, uh, the Apocrypha, the history of the Apocrypha. Who's the author? The author on this is John Bowker, B-O-W-K-E-R, but you know what? The way to find it would be to look up DK books. Okay. And because nobody can pronounce Dorling Kinslerly, they go by DK. Um, I'm going to have all this stuff up here if you all look at it, okay? Then, another a book that I use fairly often, which is uh, which I really like, it's by University Press, actually Stuart, uh, well, University Press, <coughs> the Complete Bible Study Toolkit. And this is just an example of a lot of these sorts of things are out there. This will give you um, unpacking the Old Testament, general stuff, unpacking the New Testament, how to interpret the Bible, um, in the beginning, the start of Genesis, the Promised Land from Joshua to Esther, you know, and on and on. Pictures, diagrams, descriptions, outlines, um, God's word for today's choices, different kinds of Bible writing. You know, it's fun. It really is fun as well as being useful. So, Bible handbook. And then, the last one I'm going to talk about, and then we're going to take a break for a few minutes, is two volume or similar com uh, commentaries. Now, I don't actually have one to show you because I don't have any two volume commentaries. I gave all those away. Um, I have sets of commentaries. Uh, it's a couple of those I kept. I used to have some huge ones that I used all the time, but I gave them to a church in Seattle before I came here because who knew I was gonna come here and be a pastor. But again, I, I have computer resources that I have the same stuff without having to actually have the paper books. But um, in terms of commentaries, do I do this? You can get everything from, um, like the Interpreter's Bible is, you know, they, it looks like seven encyclopedias, let's just say that, uh, to deal with the whole Bible. And it's very scholarly and you, it does a lot of the original languages. Or uh, Tyndale has a very small set of New Testament commentaries, one for each book of the Bible, or like 1st, 2nd, 3rd John is one book, etc. So you can get sets. Then they've got smaller, like two volume sets, or you can get things like uh, individual books. This is, Ralph Martin was one of my New Testament professors uh, in seminary, a uh, book, Mark, Evangelist and Theologian. It's a commentary on the book of Mark with a lot of background stuff. Or this is from the, um, the New Testament Preacher's Commentary series by Maxi Dunham. This is a book that, this one commentary covers Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. And so they'll look at each verse and they'll help you, you know, they'll give you the, the, the scripture, they'll help you understand it, give you explanations, give you cross references, all kinds of things. A commentary is someone else's explanation of what it means. Now, when we get into the inductive, these are valuable, but you don't start here. You start with the scripture. And you you go through a process, a disciplined process of of Asking the Holy Spirit, that's why you start with prayer, to help you understand what this means. What does it say? What does it mean? What does it mean to me? How do I apply it to my life? And once you've done that, it's then valuable to go to some of these other tools because you see other people's perspective. And God can use these to help you increase your understanding and your ability to apply this. Right? Any questions about any of that? Are any of those books in the library? Hang on a second. 
uh, the, the Rick Warren thing mentions one set here, the New American Commentary. It's 44 volumes. Yeah. I mean, how, that's like a whole library. Oh, absolutely. You, you know how many book, how many, how many Bible study books I had before I gave them all away? You know, I ended up giving away about 1,600. Oh, um, yeah. So, yeah, you could go a long way. I mean, these are just a few of the ones I kept. Um, if you've been in my house, you know, the books, all, pretty much all the bookshelves that I have in my study are all this, and I gave most of them away. So, yeah, you could go, I'm going to show you in a little while some standalone computer uh, study aids. Logos software has, and, and, and the best ones have different levels. You know, you can get from beginner all the way up through more complex. The highest end, which they call the Scholar's Platinum version of Logos, costs $1,700. But it's $18,000 worth of books if you bought them on paper. Okay, so, yeah. I'm sorry. You... Are any of these books in our library? Some of them are in the library. Others I will make available. Um, now that I've been able to get rid of some of the books, the, the class books I had on my bookshelf, um, some of these that are mine, I will keep on my shelf, but we'll make them available for people to come and use them in the church. Um, and eventually, I, 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 you ask, and I do want to do this, I want to go through the books that we have in our library in the church and maybe set aside a shelf and say these books are reserved for people in the classes to use. Because okay. we do have some good, some good reference books out there. Um, any other questions about this? Now, it's worth investing in this stuff, but if you are computer literate, if you're comfortable with using a computer, I'm going to show you how you can get almost everything you can imagine, either for one low price, <laughs> not for, I'm not selling it, or free. I like free. Free's good. <laughs> but you know what? If you're going to invest in anything, it's worth investing in this. All right? My wife and I have, because I do all the cooking, Carolyn has always said that I can buy anything I want for the kitchen. <laughs> Right? Anything I want to buy from the kitchen, because I do the cooking, she says it's fine. Uh, same thing is true with anything having to do with the Word of God or with the church. You know, that's the one area I don't think about what it costs because I know it's worth it. I mean, if I decide this is something that would be of value either to me or to the people that I'm trying to teach and lead, then I, I don't count pennies on that stuff, and you shouldn't either, because this is valuable stuff. I know that you, you know you may have to have a budget. That's, that's the way life is. But still, if we get extravagant spending on you know shoes, but we're stingy about spending stuff so that we can understand God's word better, eh, you want to think about that, right? Let's take a break. It is ten minutes after. Uh, I'm going to give you until eighteen minutes after. You get an eight minute break. My watch is the one that matters. It's ten after right now. See you again in a few minutes. Standby. Okay, good. Okay. Um, there are lots of kinds of tools, and they're they're valuable, and also a lot of them are fun. Um, and making it fun helps. A few things that I would recommend to you uh, that would that would be you would find very helpful is one: get a coloring a colored highlighting pens that will not leak through thin Bible paper. Most Bibles, in order to keep them from having to be so heavy, they use very thin what's called India paper. Um, it, I, I've had the experience several times where I'm, I'm reading something in passage and I go, why did I highlight that? And then I go, oh, <laughs> I highlighted something on the other side and it just came right through. They make these pens, which are dry highlighters. Um, and this has got like six colors in it. And you just push, you know, you turn it to the color you want, push the button, and that's the one that comes out. And there, it's made by Pentel. It's an eight, oh, eight color, actually, eight color Bible highlighter. And it says, recommended by K. Arthur of Precept Ministries for Inductive Bible Study. She's, it's the book we're using. And I, you know, I got extra refills. It's just something that, that when I'm making notes in the margin, I usually will use a pencil rather than a pen because it doesn't leak through. Okay. It's a simple thing, but you'll find it valuable. If you're underlining stuff or highlighting stuff, which I do a lot of, then this is useful. A second thing, which is one of the most fun things you can have, is a good Bible atlas. An atlas, of course, is a book of maps. I had everything organized up here, but apparently it's not organized anymore. <laughs> Becky Flatgate. Oh, sorry. Um, there is 
Here you have the NIV Atlas of the Bible, which is not only maps, but it's a lot of description stuff. The then and now Bible maps, which Pat is glad I've got this one. What it does is it's got all of these maps of ancient times, and they will have, oh, let me flip over here. They have a, a transparent overlay, which tells you what the countries and cities and stuff are called now. So you can look at the Bible version and then see what it's called now, okay? Um, and lots of descriptive stuff. This one, actually, I don't have it in here because it's actually my computer right now. It came with a DVD. So you can copy those, uh, which is what I use for PowerPoints and things like that. That's useful. The Nelson Complete Book of Bible Maps and Charts. This is fun because not only is it black and white maps, which are good if, you, you know, if you're needing to photocopy them for something, and, and I think you're allowed to do that as long as you're not making money off of it, um, but it also has a lot of charts. It will take books of the Bible and chart them for you. It will have genealogies and uh, outlines and, uh, let's see, um, King Herod's Dream, Caesarea on the Sea. This came with the book, which is a design for the city of Caesarea that Herod built. Uh, and on and on. Lots of, lots of fun, interesting things. The charts and stuff like that help you understand it because it organizes it in a way that you visually can take it in. Remember, you learn, different, you learn things in different ways. Not just words, but graphs and charts and things help you retain this. Yes, Bob? What was the title of that? This is Nelson's Complete Book of Bible Maps and Charts. There's also, this is one that Thor Palmer has recommended to us before our last trip, The Biblical World, an Illustrated Atlas. This one has lots of great pictures and maps and articles, you know, cool pictures. Uh, I haven't even actually found a map yet, but they have them. Um, see? So, very valuable tool in, seeing, in understanding the background locations. If you can picture where it was, it, and you know, how far is it from Jerusalem to Joppa? Okay. Uh, if you're talking about Peter going there and before he met Cornelius and Caesarea and all that kind of stuff, then this is helpful. And another thing that's, that's kind of cool, can you tell that I enjoy this stuff? <laughs> I love books anyway. Uh, the Bible Timeline. Now this is a, I'm giving you these as samples. There's almost every possible permutation you can imagine if you start looking for it. The Bible timeline, uh, it takes, oh, not that side. <laughs> it's blank. Um, it takes the whole history of the world from creation, of course it doesn't have a lot of detail early on, and it, it looks at it not only in terms of what's happening in the Bible and who the writers are and all that and the kings, but it also looks at what's happening in the rest of the world at that time. You know, what was happening in Egypt and then later in Rome? You know, who were the emperors? When was the wheel invented? You know, et cetera, et cetera. And so you, you get a lot of this kind of context that I think is very not only very interesting but very valuable. Um, and plus, you can play with it. Um, so there are a lot of tools like this that, that are very fun and, and useful. I've had a couple of people say, uh, how did you learn all this stuff? All right? And please understand, I'm not saying that in any way boastful way at all, but people have asked me that question. Uh, mostly because I think this is fun, you know, this kind of stuff. And I immerse myself in that. I mean, I'll sit down on my desk and I'll start working with some of this stuff and I've realized four or five hours have gone by because I think it's really interesting. Um, and if you think it's interesting, then you, you not only retain it, but it's, you know, you grow in it and you learn it. And I'm not that disciplined a person, honestly, but I enjoy this. And when I, because I've got these cool kind of tools, if I didn't have the pictures and the charts and the maps and the, you know, the fun stuff, photographs, I probably wouldn't be nearly as interested in it. So I recommend them to you for that reason, okay? Um, word studies for Hebrew, Old Testament, and Greek. Now this is for those of you who are more serious and in in, want to get involved in this. Um, again, somebody moved my books. <laughs> Becky Plenke. Um, all right, I didn't bring my vines. The standard word study book is called the vines. And what it does is it takes the words, you can look up an English word, 
and it will tell you what the Hebrew word or the Greek was, word, and the various permutations of it, and what the subtleties are. Um, just off the top of my head, I hadn't thought about this. What's the difference in the word angry, and the word frustrated, and the word upset, and the word ticked off? Okay, they're, Those all mean basically the same thing, but they're kind of subtle differences, right? You know, furious. What's the difference in furious and mad? It's a matter of degree, right? Furious is madder than mad. Well, those kinds of differences, the, the same kind of subtleties and difference exist in Hebrew and in Greek, especially in Greek. Well, and a, a, a vines, and there are other word study books, will allow you to look up words, and they actually have every, every, every book in the, uh, every word in the Bible is numbered. You know, there's a Strong's number and a Vines number that you can look up, you know, that, that's how detailed they've got. And it will give you all the subtle differences. It'll give you the base word, and then it'll say in, 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 in this verse, it's got a slightly different <coughs> version of that, and it means this as a subtle difference. And it's very valuable once if you really get into it. You then have, in addition to word studies like that in, in Greek and Hebrew, um, you've got, like this is an interlinear. Um, this is Revised Standard Version Interlinear Greek English New Testament. What it does is it has the Greek text. Right below it, it has the English translation, word for word literal. And then over in the side columns, here and here, it's got how it reads in the Revised Standard Version. And you can get the same thing for NIV or for others. Okay? I've had this for a long time, and that was, you know, RSV was, I don't think they had an NIV when I first got this. So you can see the Greek. You can see the literal translation of the Greek words, and then you can see how it is communicated in the English version that we would have. And that will help you, for those of you, a couple of you have expressed an interest in the original languages, this is a good way to get into that. This is Greek. This is an interlinear Hebrew, English, Old Testament. Same thing. The Hebrew, which remember Hebrew reads right to left, the English translation of those words, and then how it's, how it's written in the English version. And this one is actually the NIV, Hebrew English. And another one that's kind of fun, if you're interested in the Greek, this is a synopsis of the four Gospels. We talked earlier about parallel Bibles, which have like the King James and the Revised Standard and the New American Standard and the NIV all on one page so you can compare them. Well, this is a little similar. It's sort of similar to that in that, find a good example here. The, um, that's good. The synopsis of the four Gospels is, you know, a lot of the same stories that are in Mark are in Matthew and, and Luke, etc. This takes the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and on one page it will give you the, the words, the passages from those that relate to the same story, like um, the healing of, of uh, Peter's mother-in-law or whatever it is. And it will show you, and if there's a gap, it means that that's not something that one of the Gospels had. But the other thing about this is, it has it in Greek. So you can see the Greek as well. So the Gospels are paralleled, and the Greek is paralleled. So you've got it in English and you've got it in Greek. Um, you get into the studies, and there are tools like this that are very valuable. Um, the reason why I have not planned, I'll have to my mind about this, Aaron. The reason I haven't planned to get into the biblical languages is because, one, that would mean I would have to go back and relearn the biblical languages, and I've forgotten most of it. The reason I've forgotten it, and the reason why I have not planned to teach it as part of our uh, instituto, is because tools are available today that mean you don't actually have to study the Greek and Hebrew in order to get the value. Other scholars have done so much work in that regard that you can read their studies in English and appreciate and get the value of what the subtle meanings are in the Hebrew and the Greek. It doesn't mean that it's ideal. Ideal is you learn the biblical languages. Ideal is you learn them and you don't forget them. Uh, but I just haven't worked in them in so long that I, it would take me a huge amount of effort to get back to the place that I feel like I could try to teach those. Maybe I will. We'll see what happens. So, word studies, additional Bible translations or versions over the two, you know, I said Two Bibles in the same translation, a reading Bible, a study Bible, at least two other versions, one of which could be a paraphrase, for instance, like the Living Bible or the Message, and perhaps other additional translations, 
And then additional commentaries, including book-specific commentaries, like the one I mentioned there on the book of Mark or whatever. Okay? Those are all helpful. Now, I'm going to tell you another completely different approach for those of you who are comfortable with computer. First, there are standalone computer Bible programs. This is what I use. By the way, there's a web, uh, a web address up there at Christianity Today where they uh, reviewed some of the top Bible software, if you're interested. Some of which costs, some of which is free. One of the great advantages you have is that there are a lot of organizations out there, ministries, churches, individuals, who want you to grow in your knowledge of the Word, and so they offer stuff for free. Have you gotten your bill for the Instituto yet? Okay. Same reason we offer this free, because we want you to grow and benefit. There are people who offer resources online or downloadable that are free to help you learn God's Word. The one I use is the first one on this list, PC Study Bible 5. And I'm going to show that to you in just a minute, but let me tell you some of the others. The PC Study Bible, um, I think the lowest level of it is like $49, and the highest level, the, you know, the full, full, uh, full blown soup to nuts version is about $350. Uh, we'll look at that. The Logos Bible software, I think if I were doing this today, starting all over again, I might go with Logos. I think the low end of Logos is like $149, and the high end is $1,700, $1,699, something like that. But, like I say, that $1,700, and that's the Scholar's Platinum Edition, which has a lot of original language stuff, biblical language stuff, that's $18,000 worth of books if you went to a, to a bookstore and bought So one of the things is, while it sounds like there's a lot of money, it's a lot less than what you pay if you bought paper. Is that Logos you're talking about? Logos, Logos, yes. Um, and Logos is the Greek word for word, right? Then Quick First, 2010 Deluxe. Quick First was actually the first Bible software I ever used, and it was pretty primitive when I was using it. The new one is pretty highly rated. And there's one called Sword Searcher. And uh, then two free versions, which are rated pretty highly. One of them is called E-Sword. Remember, Scripture is called the sword in Scripture, you know, the two-edged sword. The Word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword. And then one called Bible Explorer. Those last two are both free. You can download them free from the internet. Now let me show you a little bit about, if I can get this to work. Uh, and sword, and what was the last one? Can, can you back oh, sure, Bible Explorer. Okay. And I'll come back to this in a minute anyway. Uh, let's see where I am there. PC Study Bible. I think this is the second to load. Um, I strongly recommend, like PC Study Bible, Pat, you remember once um, when, when I was doing the bulletin and you were going to take over when I was gone and you said the problem was that at that time we were printing out the, the verses in Spanish and you said you didn't have typewriter that did Spanish. I never type over a scripture verse. I copy and paste. And I've got every translation and every version you can imagine in a dozen different languages. Um, I can research any of those. Okay. Move for PC Study Bible, the Fire Bible. I know that. Okay. This is the, the landing page for PC Study Bible, which is a, it's a standalone piece of software, which means this is not on the internet. I have this on my computer. Okay, I bought it. It has, uh, among other things, Bibles. Um, let me go to tools. Okay, you're not letting me do that. Something stuck. Huh. I'm not seeing something I should be able to see because I'm not seeing the whole screen. Let me go over here and do this. Well, let me see if I can figure out why it's not. I've never had this happen before. Okay. <laughs> um, let me just give you, I'll just talk about it since I can't get it to come up. And for some reason, this is jamming, and I don't know if it has something to do with the fact we have it on the projector or what. Uh, there are devotionals in this. There are, I think, 
28 different versions of the Bible. There's three different versions of the NIV. Uh, the NIV 1984, the NIV Reader's Edition, today's NIV, and actually I discovered I don't have the 2011 on here, and I need to get that. There are concordances for every version. doesn't matter what version you have. You don't have to set, have a separate concordance because it will look it up based upon whatever version you have up right then. Um, it has commentaries. When I'm preparing for a sermon and I have a scripture verse, I will go through, one of my standard things to doing here is I will study the, the word and get my own understanding interpretation. I will go through the many, many commentaries that are on here, which I wish you could see. Um, and I will go to that verse. And once, I, once I've, I'm, I'm on a verse, like I have the NIV Bible up and I have the verse on, if I go to commentary and I go to James Fawcett, or I go to... That's just because I uh, ended up with the cursor down there. Um, and I go to, to, to any, any of the commentaries, it will automatically bring me up that commentary and what they said about that passage. And what I will do is, after I've done my own study and prayer and search for you know, my thought about this, I'll go through every one of the 20 or so commentaries, I'll spend about a half an hour, and I'll go to that place, and I'll copy and paste it into a Word document. And that Word document will end up being 12 to 14 pages. I print it out, and then I sit down and I read what other people have said about it, and I highlight things, and then I go back and take what I've done and what they've all said, and I write my sermon from that. Because I've got all of that material is right there on the computer. I wish I could show it to you. Uh, I'll do it next time if I can't hear. It's got Greek and Hebrew. It's got other books. For instance, it's got, uh, it's got sermons. It's got studies. It's got Calvin's Institutes. Um, it's got the writings of Martin Luther, it's got Charles Spurgeon's works, which this is part of it, this is a devotional that Spurgeon has, that, that I have as my landing page, um, and on and on. It's got media, photographs and maps, etc. You know, it's got, um, you can download additional things. It's got topical Bibles. All of this is included in this one piece, and all of it's interrelated. If I bring up a scripture verse, it will connect me, if I ask it to, to maps of the, you know, the region that that's taking place or to all kinds of other materials. So if you have this, then you don't need all those books. You don't need most of these other books. Now, there's value to be able to sit down like with that DK book because of the photographs and everything else. And, and, and it's got different articles and stuff like that. Um, a lot of this stuff is, is really quality, but some of it's kind of old. It's Spurgeon, you know, Spurgeon. It was no spring chicken. I mean, no, he's, he's from the 19th century. But it, it's terrifically valuable, all right? But you don't need concordances. You don't need concordances. You don't need the topical Bibles or dictionaries or any of that stuff. Okay. Maps. Maps on here. Now, the maps on here are not as good as some of the maps on some of these other things, which is why I bought those books. But the stuff is here, okay? Now, let me see if I can... Configuring the DLLs. Still not doing it. Okay. Um, now, the other option here are free <laughs> online tools. A significant portion of everything I've been talking about to you today is free online. Again, because there are people, ministries, churches, individuals, who make this available to you because they want you to grow in God's Word. It's a ministry to them. One of the best is the one that Bob mentioned earlier, BibleGateway.com. And, and Carolyn's addicted to this one. Carolyn doesn't have the, the software tools resident on her computer like I do on mine because she uses this. BibleGateway.com, there's passage lookup, which means if you wanted to look up John 3.16, you type John 3.16 in there, and it will, it will give you what that passage says. And you can look at it. These are the English versions that they have on this free software. New International, New International Readers, New Century, New American Standard, the Mount's Reverse Interlinear uh, New Testament, which means you look up the English and it tells you what the Greek is rather than look up the Greek and it tells you what the English is. That's why it's reverse. The Message, the paraphrase, Lexham English Bible, King James Version, the J.D. Phillips New Testament, Holman Christian Standard Bible, which I told you is one of the newer I really like translation. 
Good News Translation, which is a paraphrase, God's Word Translation, English Standard Version, English Standard Version Anglicized, Easy to Read Version, Douay Reims, 1899 American. And that's before I moved the scroll bar. <laughs> okay, there's 21st Century King James, American Standard, Amplified, Common English, Common Jewish, etc. Okay, then Espanol, all of these, Reina Valera, Nueva Version Internacional, um, Francaise, Greek, Koine, Greek, Greek Bibles, uh, Hebrew Bibles, Hindi Bibles, Croatian Bibles, Haitian Bibles, Hungarian Bibles, Hawaiian Pigeon Bibles, Icelandic Bibles, Italian Bibles, Kechi Bibles, I don't even know what that is, uh, Latin, Maori, Marathi, you get the idea? Wow. Can you look up a subject? Yes. Now that's the passage lookup. You can look up keyword if you're looking for slavery. What does it say about slavery? Or you can look up topic. That's the subject. You can look up Trinity, for instance, even though that word doesn't occur, and it will give you passages based upon what, and it uses names topical Bible, based upon whatever translation you say you want to use. They have, um, here it has the available versions. You know, you can, Amharic is Ethiopian. Amharic is the, the it's a Semitic language in English. Yeah, that, that's what the Coptic uh, was written in. Um, Arabic, da da da, etc. You've got audio Bibles. If you want to listen to the Bible. Um, New International Version, read by Max McLean. Genesis, Genesis 1 to Genesis 1, whatever. Okay, uh, I've got it on a loop, I think. Just a minute. You'll hear Max McLean. You hear that? The book of Genesis, chapter 1. In the beginning, God created that. If I had better speakers or had it turned up, you'd hear about it. the earth was formless. Okay. In whatever translation I was uh, This is This is all. Free! This is free! Online! BibleGateway.com! Um. I better turn off the audio or we're going to listen to the max. From the darkness. God called the night day. The darkness he called night. Alright. Shutting that. It keeps coming back. Alright. Audio levels. Okay. Okay. Um. I think you get the idea. There are commentaries on there. There are all kinds of other resources on there. You have no excuse for not using these tools. You can't say, well, I'm in Mexico, I can't buy them. You can't say, I can't afford them. Or if you've got a computer, and you can put in www.biblegateway.com, you'll have everything I just showed you and more. Now, um, Let's go back to this. Now, BibleGateway.com is, I think, probably the best and one of the best known. Bible.com also has resources similar to this. BibleStudyTools.com has tools. And some of this is just a matter of taste. Which one feels better for you? Do you like most? If you look if you go on Google or any other search engine you use, Bing, whatever, and put in Bible study tools, there's an, a mountain of stuff that you can get free. So no excuses. Now there is some advantage. Roz was just saying because her doctor told her to keep her feet up, she, left, she lies down and takes her Bible and reads it. Well, you know what? Unless you've got a, a really light laptop, it's kind of hard to do that with this. But that's one of the reasons why you want to have books sometimes. Um, to keep your feet up. Her doctor told her to do that, okay? Leave her alone. Uh, there's tons of resources available that you can access and take advantage of. Any questions about that? And if you want more information, that, web, that website up there, again, those of you who didn't hear me, all of this has been uploaded to the site, but I'm having technical problems getting the, the email to be able to connect, to send to you to connect to it. 
I will resolve that problem this weekend, or you will never see me again. Okay. Yeah. So that by, before the end of the weekend, you will get an email that will take you to a website where all of the PowerPoint notes that you have had for the classes, both this class as well as the other two classes, if you're going to them, will all be on there. And it will be on there both as PowerPoint, which is what this is, and also PDF, which is much smaller, if you, in case you don't have Microsoft Office or PowerPoint. If you've got a Microsoft at all or anything almost at all, you can open a PDF file. So, Dave. If you were to recommend one of the free sites, which would you recommend? Uh, BibleGateway.com. And, I, you know, I, and I, I can tell you what my favorites of various things are. I've told you I like the NIV and the NIV Study Bible, and it's not just me, you know. Uh, but there are other good ones, too. I, I mentioned to you that, that this, the Master Study Bible, is quite good, you know, as, as, as an academic Bible. I don't think it's as good as the NIV Study Bible, but it's still good. This, in fact, to give you some ideas of Study Bible, um, this is all study aids. That much is all study aids in this Bible, and a lot of them are like that. Okay, it's it's like forty percent of the whole Bible is after the end of Revelation. So there's a lot of resource in these Bibles, and I have a name tag in this one. Uh, as I say, I like the Holman Christian uh, Standard Bible, which is fairly new. The ESV is also good, and this one has has wonderful re uh, resources in it, all the way through it. So there are a lot of options. NIV is still my favorite. Okay, I want to spend the last few minutes talking about what I call the three levels of personal Bible study. And the reason I'm doing it for you, I really want to recommend to you the full inductive Bible study that we're going to start working with next week, which is what Kate Arthur's book especially is all about. An inductive study where you have a disciplined approach, where you get into God's Word, and... and by, by prayer, ask the Holy Spirit to help you understand God's message for you in that Bible. The Bible was not written in such a way that it should be, that it's really hard to understand. God wants you to understand it. He's not trying to trick you or trip you uh, or, or make it hard for you. Now, there is value to all these other study aids, but these need to come second. First, you need to say, what is the Bible saying? What does it mean? What does it mean to me? How do I apply it to my life? Before you ask anybody else what they think about it. And that's what inductive Bible study does. You start with, what does it say? What does it mean? What does it mean to me? How do I apply it to my life? And then you sort of add a dimension to that by looking at other scholars and what other people have said about it. But I'm going to give you, the fact is, this is hard work. And not all of you are going to end up doing this. And so I want to give you some approach that you will still be able to grow in God's Word, in addition to the more... The, the sort of um, heavy-duty, serious Bible study we're going to be talking about in this class. And, and I'm going to tell you right up front, when we get into uh, Kay Arthur's book, and we start talking about inductive Bible study, and she's talking about using symbols and, you know, underlining and arcing and all, I don't do that. Because I, my approach to Bible study is different because when I do Bible study, part of it's because I've been doing it for a long time, but part of it's because when I do Bible study, I have a particular goal in mind. I do it in order to teach it or to preach it. And so I have my own system. But I get at the same stuff she does. Alright? And I'm confessing that to you right up front. I know the system but I, I have a different approach because of what I use it for. Her approach is meant for you personally to benefit from it. And then at the end of the class, the last class we have in here, we're going to be talking about you leading Bible studies. But this is a good discipline to learn. Some of you are not going to do this, so I want to give you some options, being as fair as I can about that. First, and as I talked about, look, just read, okay? Just read it. Take up and read the Word of God. If you will do that much, your life will change. And I've told you how I do it every morning. Feed the dogs, make the coffee, sit down, read until I feel like that's enough for I start with prayer, I end with prayer, I stop and think about it as I go along, but just read it. Don't get in a hurry, don't set any goals, don't say, well, I have to get up at 5.30 even though I am not even a human being until Saturday. Don't do that. 
don't, you know, don't say, well, if I don't read and memorize all of the genealogies in, you know, Numbers by Tuesday, then I'm going to be a failure as a Christian. No, just read it. Let it pour through you. Ask God to bless you in that way. Now, you'll benefit from that. You should do more than that. But if you don't do anything else, do that. And do it every day. Okay? I hope I've convinced you how seriously I believe this. So that's one. And that's why if you don't have a Bible that's a simple, easy-to-read translation that you can use for a reading Bible, see me and I will give you one. Second, the next level of complexity or of seriousness or of study, whatever you want to call it, is to read, but read it not in a Bible like this that doesn't have footnotes and, and study aids, but rather read it in a good study Bible. And as you read, while you're reading, take the time to look at the notes, the footnotes, the text notes, occasionally the cross-references. If you're reading in Luke, then and it tells you this, this passage is referred to also in Mark. Read that one too. So th the point is, you don't have, a, and I'm, here I'm talking about not having a notebook, you can tell you how important it is to write it down. This is to be the intermediate, where you take your study Bible, and let's say you're reading in Isaiah, okay? And you read the fall of Babylon, chapter 47. Go down, sit in the dust, virgin daughter of Babylon, sit on the ground without a throne. Virgin daughter of Babylon, 47, one. Sit in the dust. A sign of mourning is sitting in the dust. The virgin daughter of Babylon is the personification of Babylon. There's an additional note on 2 Kings 19.21. This will help me understand what that says. And I just, I just did what I told you not to do. I just opened it. And that's the passage it came to. They call that Bible roulette. Have you ever heard that? Somebody says, okay, I've got a problem. I really need a solution. Lord, how about that? Okay, that's the introduction to the book of Daniel. That's not going to help you. Okay. Don't do that. Yeah, God can do miracles, but he expects you to be a little more disciplined than that in the way you use his word. But So the second level, though, is read it, but take time to read the footnotes. Check the cross-references. Come to more understanding, informational understanding, of what it is telling you, without still going to the full-blown, keeping a notebook, journal, you know, diagramming and marking and explanations and outlining the chapters and all that. You should... I recommend all those things. Those are good things. But I'm realistic that, you know, my guess is one out of five of you are actually going to do that, even though I'm going to teach you how. The rest of you should be doing at least the first two of these. Sometimes, you know, there should, I mean, there should be some time in your day, first thing in the morning, where you do the just read. And then there should be at least one time a week where you set aside an hour or two, and you do at least this second one, where you actually are studying a little bit, but without the, you know, the, the full system, the, the, the inductive system that Precepts and K Arthur teach, okay? And we're going we're gonna to experience that. We're going to work on that in the next few weeks. And then third, establish the discipline, and you should all do this, but I'm realistic. I've been teaching Bible long enough to know how people do and don't go out from here. Establish the discipline of a full inductive plus. I say inductive plus because you do the inductive and then you go to some of these tools to see what do they say. You add to your own inductive experience. And remember, inductive means you start with the scripture and you take it in and see what it says to you before you see what somebody else said. An inductive approach using additional study tools and then keeping a written notebook of your thoughts, observations, interpretations, questions, and applications. If you're not doing the first two of those, then you're not growing as a Christian at all. Unless you are really miraculously anointed of God somehow. I hope you are. But you need to be doing the two of those. And you really ought to be doing the third one. You can live without it, but you ought to be doing the full-blown inductive, what I call inductive plus, that's my expression, Bible study. Questions about that? Comments? If you don't do the first one, shame on you. If you don't do the second one, you ought to be doing better. Okay? If you don't do the third one, well, you're human. But you ought to still. Okay? And 
next week we're gonna I'm gonna look at the NIV Study Bible, and when we look at the NIV Study Bible and the tools that are in it, we're gonna talk about number two, how I'm talk what I'm talking about when we talk about reading, but also using the references, and that's why the Study Bible, because you don't have to go somewhere else to find resources. They're right here, and you can get. A lot of material, a lot of growth, a lot of benefit, a lot of understanding just from this one book. Even if you don't have a notebook app to write in or anything else. And that's what we're going to talk about next week is what this book has in it and how you use the tools in it. And particularly how you do number two in terms of the second level of uh, Bible school. And then we're going to spend three weeks getting into a practica of doing inductive Bible study. All right? Questions? Are you following along? Yes. For next week, your reading assignments. Isn't that weird? Okay, in the K. Arthur book, you only read four, to page 14 last week. I want you to read page 15 to 52. And that's very easy reading. This is, I mean, in fact, some of the pages are blank charts. Don't anybody panic about reading 35 pages of that. In the Rick Warren book, I want you to read page 49 to 95. And again, a lot of those are blank pages with just, you know, blank forms that you can create. And in the NIV Study Bible, I want you to read page 14 in the Roman numerals, which is the very front, you know, before books like this, before they really start the serious stuff, they have Roman numeral pages, like the table of contents and all that. Starting on page 14 is the the Quick Start Guide, and the Introduction to the NIV Study Bible. And I want you to read that through page 9. Page 9 goes through the introduction to Genesis so that you can see what a chapter, or a book introduction, excuse me, a book introduction looks like in here. And then I want you to review, meaning skim over it, be aware of it. I don't expect you to read all of it because it's not stuff to be read. These are the study aids in the back. Page 2179 is where you get tables of weights and measures. Then you get the topical index, the Bible dictionary, the concordance, and the maps. Look through this. Be aware of what it says. And, uh, I mean, be aware of how it's laid out. And see if you have any questions about it. And we'll talk about how you use those things later. But I want you to have looked at it. So that when we come in, you'll know what I'm talking about when I say, okay, the topical index or the Bible dictionary, the concordance, those are all things that are in the back. But you don't have to read every entry in the concordance. That's why I say review, not read. Questions? We're good? Let me close in prayer. We thank you, Father, for your word. We thank you that it is the thing that teaches us of you and of your son, Jesus. We thank you that in it we can find the real meaning for our life in your Son and the rest of the guide that we need in order to live our life in a way that is fulfilling for ourselves and satisfying to you. Give us the wisdom and the discipline to utilize the skills that you teach us. Make your work part of our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.